from the nation's capital, this is the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast with your host, Rob Snowett. For downloading the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast. This is Series 1, Episode 96, Outfitting for Shad. This podcast is brought to you by Risen Fly. Go check them out at risenfly.com. And I'm going to give you a little commercial from the Lancaster Show right now before we get started. All right, so first podcast, we're at Risen Fly. What's going on? Oh, uh, we got all kinds of good stuff coming out this year. Brought out uh, since the last time you uh, you interviewed us at the Lancaster Show last year. Uh, added a few new fly boxes. Um, we've got some waterproof briefcase boxes, but the one that's making uh, the big waves right now is our silicon insert waterproof box. Um, so. You know, we've got one company out there, a big competitor that uh, has a similar style box. Uh, our price is uh, almost close to about 40 to 50% cheaper than theirs. It's double-sided, holds more flies, and uh, and it's waterproof. So, uh, you know, we're, we're kicking some butt out there. We've sold, we've been at like three shows in the last month or so, um, and have probably sold 100 of these boxes throughout three shows. So, so they're doing they're doing great. That's the uh, the little new thing. The big new thing is we've got our new rod series coming out. We've got pre-orders going on the site right now for two sizes: a nine foot five weight and a ten foot three weight uh, with a fighting butt on it. And this is a uh, high quality, uh, high module blank. It's an IM12 graphite blank, burlwood insert. It's a beautiful looking rod. We're trying to compete with some of the, you know, high end six, seven hundred dollar rods out there, and this is going to list under three hundred bucks. So it's uh, it's getting a lot of good uh, good head turners here at these shows, and we should have them out in stock hopefully by late April, early May at the latest. Speaking of turning heads, you got the beads here today, the silver ones. We don't. I know that's your absolute the favorite. Are the best. We've got we've got this little booth here, and uh, and I've got so many beads and hooks at the you know in storage that I just couldn't bring them all. But yeah, it's a uh, it's a Rob Snow White special, the uh, silver beads. Yes. So where can we find these online? These boxes are are awesome. And you said the, the it's offset where you put the hook in, so you're not backing into the fly in the row in front or behind. Correct. So yeah, you're not the the rows for where you put your hooks are not lined up, so that you're you, you can fit a little bit more in there and uh, you know cram as many flies in there. I think it fits a little over 200 flies in the box. So yeah, it's a it's a great box. Like I said, we've been selling them like crazy. Um, everything that we do is all online. That helps uh, reduce our overhead, so we can take some of our savings and put it back in your pockets instead of ours. Um, so it's all on risenfly.com. That's R I S E N F L Y dot com. Is there a specific name for the waterproof silicon box that you can refer They're to? They're just the silicon waterproof boxes. We got real fancy with it this time. Yeah. <laughs> and at the show, they're thirteen fifty. So thirteen fifty. Y'all missed out. out to Lancaster. We got a few hours left. Um, they listed eighteen bucks, so we knocked them down twenty five percent. But if you keep in touch with us, go on our social media pages, Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, or you go onto our uh, email list. Uh, we don't send you eighty seven emails a month. We do usually do about two to four. Um, and you'll hear some of our, our sales that go on, and we'll mark them down here and there periodically throughout the year. Very cool. What about, do you have any uh, sinking lines over here? We don't do sinking lines. Sinking? We get like 10 people that show up every single show okay. and ask about sinking lines. So it's it's coming eventually, but be we're not there yet. Big on the shad because, you know, uh-huh. you don't need to spend 90 bucks on a fly line. I know. That's why we've got our two series of fly lines. The list price is 28 and 48 bucks, and we're, uh, you know, we sell a ton of them at these shows because people People don't want to pay an arm and a leg uh, to, to cast their line out there. Absolutely. All right. Very cool. Thanks so much. Hey, thank you. Right on. We're going to bump elbows now. All Go right. Handshake. Now on to the meat and potatoes of the podcast. I've done a previous podcast about this time last year on the flies I think you need for catching shad on the fly rod. I'll talk briefly about those today. But you're going to want to go back to spring or light, late winter of 2016 for that podcast. That one was just uh, off the top of my head with a handful of tangible flies. In this podcast, I 
made a comprehensive list. I'm going to talk about rods, reels, lines, leaders, flies, waders, footwear gadgets, and additional information and some websites and phone numbers that I believe are pertinent to what you need to be a successful shad fisher person. I've said it before, shad are the least technical fish to catch on the fly rod. You just have to do a couple of certain things right, and you have to get your fly to the fish. And I'm going to discuss those today. This is basically answering FAQs that pop up on the Tidal Potomac Fly Rodders message board. These are constant emails I get, social media questions. I'm going to put this in a comprehensive podcast now, as opposed to you listening to that hour-long podcast from, it's got to be like six years ago, where I did my entire talk on shad fishing. So let's talk about rods. What kind of length and weight and action do you need? Take off my sweater. It's getting warm. All right. I'm hanging out here with my fish dingleberry, and uh, let's talk about the rods. What's going on, fish? You want to say hi? It's definitely looking over here. All right, rods. You don't want a short rod. The longer, the better if you're fishing from shore. And I'm going to go back and forth between shore, boat, and wade fishing throughout all this. But if you're on shore, the longer the rod, better cast you're going to get. So I'm going to say nine foot standard. You can go nine foot six inches, which is better. You can go to a 10 foot rod. Superb. I think an 11 foot rod will get you more fish to the shore than at other length rods. Now, if you're fishing from a boat, standard nine foot rod is fine. And if you are wade fishing, again, nine foot. But shore fishing, especially on the shores of the Potomac, you're going to want to have a longer rod. It basically has to do with the three, four, five triangle. You are the X axis going vertical. The water is the Y axis and the Z axis is your hypotenuse. So if you want to get further out on the Y axis, you need to have your X axis higher and it'll, your line then will stretch out three, four, five triangles. We've got to go back to geometry for some of this. So I want you to have a rod that is best suited for where you are fishing under conditions. So standard nine foot rod is fine. I want you to have a five to eight weight rod. I think anything heavier than an eight weight, it's going to be exhausting to cast all day. And frankly, you're just not going to get the fun fight of shad fishing unless you tire easily from hooking 14 to 22 inch fish all day long. I want you to have a medium to fast action. Well, let's go back to five weight. I think five weight is the ideal rod for hickory, fishing, schoolie stripers, white perch, crappie, and herring. If you're going to start targeting American shad, which are larger, you're going to want a heavier rod just for that backbone to fight them. If you are out where the bigger fish are, mainly blue catfish, walleye, stripers, big smallmouth, big carp, maybe some larger snakeheads if they're in your water. That's when you're going to want the bigger rod just to have that backbone to fight the fish. Plus, it's probably going to be windy where you are, so the density of your line is going to enable you to cast further and better through the wind. And having a higher weight rod means you have a line with more grains into it, which is more dense, which then will further cut through the air. Now, medium of fast action, don't come out Thomas, I know you like to fish your butter weight out there, but in my expertise of taking people out for taking people out for the shad run now since '99, you well for me we're we're shore fishing, so roll casting. The glass glass rods are are not the slow rods in general are not going to benefit you roll casting all day long with the lines and flies that I'm going to be telling you to fish. You want a longer rod that's stiff to allow you to roll cast more and cut through that wind and just fish in adverse conditions. And you will get tired roll casting constantly all day long or overhand casting and shooting line, whatever. The softer the rod, the more work you are going to have to do. It's going to be fun to fight a fish on that, but in the long run, you're going to, 
you're going to regret it. So maybe if you want to fish it for a brief period of time, that's great. But as your all-day rod, you're going to want fast action. And ideally, your rod has to roll cast. If you're coming out to fish with me, you're going to be roll casting on shore. I don't want you doing a single overhand cast. I don't care. There are trees and rocks behind us, and you are going to hit those on your back cast, and you're going to shred the leader, and you're going to destroy the flies that I tied for you. Now, if you want to fish your own leaders and flies, go right ahead and do your Brad Pitt cast. But a roll cast is the ideal cast from shore when shad fishing. If you're standing out in the water and no one's around you, go ahead and overhand cast. If you're on a boat, go ahead and overhand cast. It's not going to be a problem unless it's crowded, which if you're down in Fredericksburg, if you're up on Deer Creek, if you're out in Fletcher's Cove, you're going to be in a crowded situation where you might not be able to get the ideal back cast. So again, a roll cast would be... Ideal. For me, I want you to roll cast 60 feet. Ideal. A minimum, if you can't roll cast 30 feet, well, you're going to be able to by the end of fishing with me, but practice roll casting before you get out there. And you can go back to my casting analogy podcast and get all my tips and tricks for roll casting. Your rod should have a fighting butt because at times you're going to get tired and you're going to want to stick that rod into your gut and just get some extra leverage. These are strong fish. They're fork-tailed, ocean-going fish that live way down deep in the ocean and probably get chased by who knows what down there. They're strong. They're pissed off, and the males are raging with testosterone. They're like a gorilla juice head in a bar. You, um, You know that they're a little stronger than the average one around you. So fighting butts are good. If you're fishing a you know nine foot five weight, you're probably not going to have a fighting butt. But once you get up into your six weight saltwater rods, I don't fish freshwater six weights. Probably my all time favorite fly rod was my Orvis Trident rod nine zero six four. It was this emerald green with a cork fighting butt, and I fish that rod more around and up and down the East Coast and out West than any other rod I've ever fished. I loved that rod. And it had a fighting butt. And I, you can also take these rods in the salt water as opposed to a real seat rod for fresh water that's going to be made out of possibly wood. If you have a salt water rod, it's going to have you know, metal or some kind of poly something in there which will make it salt water resistant. That's about it for rods. Make sure you've got a warranty on it. I see a lot of rods get broken during the shad run. Big heavy flies hitting rods, you'll break a rod. Uh, Snagging on rocks and yanking it, you're going to break a rod. Falling on the rocks, tripping, you're going to break it. Misstepping in the boat, you're going to break it. Stuff happens, and during the shad run is when gear gets used a lot, and it gets worked, and things can fail. So it also helps to have a spare rod. My new rod for the Shad Run is going to be a Douglas Outdoors 9'5 weight that I picked up at Lancaster. I'm pretty stoked. And I'll, I'll tell you the line we're going to pair with that in a bit. Your reel, you know, you want something solid more for if you slip. You know, the Potomac is nothing but rocks on the shore down there in the upper tidal section. My reels for guiding down there get the snot beaten out of them because people slip, people drop them. For whatever reason, they're going to get dinged up. So you don't want a plastic reel. You don't want something that is going to get dented. Uh, So we're talking like die cast versus machined. If it's die cast where liquid aluminum is poured into something, you can chip it, dent it, etc. But if you have... A machined one where it's carved out of a solid chunk of metal it should be a little bit stronger, and that's going to give you just a little more stability and insurance with your rod and reel combo. 5.6 reels are great for your 5.6 weights. 8.9 reel is ideal for your 7.8 and 9 weights. Uh, I'm not a 7-weight guy. You can talk to Art about that or my client from Saudi Arabia who – Saudi Arabia, who's just out here, and he had never caught a fish on his seven weight 
rod, so I changed that for him, and he hooked a lot of fish last week. It was pretty cool. So, um, Omar, if you're listening, it was it was fun fishing with you. You got some crazy good weather before this ice storm showed up. I want you to have a large arbor with a decent drag system because there are things during the shad run that will eat your shad fly that are bigger and badder and stronger, and you don't want to end up getting your reel smoked. If you remember, Jason was down here. He hooked something at Chain Bridge, and his reel had like smoke coming out of it. Whatever that fish was, was big, and it got into fast water, and then your reel turns into a fighting tool rather than a storage tool for your line. So you should have a good drag system, preferably something to keep it clean. If you're fishing tidal flats, you're probably dealing with a lot of sand and grit. There's plenty of that junk up where we are on shore. If you're on a boat, you're going to hook who knows what. So you should have a reel that can handle it, especially something that's not going to have knuckle busting knobs on it. If you got something soft, I, I miss the old rubber paddles that they used to put on the reels. Now it's just, you know, wood or aluminum or plastic. And again, if you can take a beating, I've got my Ross reel over here. I picked this one up. You remember in Colorado, more or less for free. It's a Ross Gunnison. Um, It's got scratches all around it. So as a used reel, I'm not too concerned that this is going to get further dinged up. It's a pretty awesome reel. I'll give you that. You can't beat a $20 Orvis fly rod with uh, a reel thrown in for free. Good, good stuff. Line. This is a big one that, you know, most people don't ask me what kind of reel. But you should have multiple reels with different lines on them. We'll get to that next. So your line. Choose the line that best fits your budget, but also gets you to where the fish are. If you're wade fishing, you're probably in shallow water. You can get away with Upstream cast, let it mend and swing it downstream. That'll be fine. If you're in a boat, you're going to want um, fast sinking. And if you're from shore, you want fast to medium action sinking. You want lines that you can roll cast easily. You want lines that you can shoot distance easily. And I've got a couple of lines down here. I'll get to those in a minute as my, my visual aids in my office are not going to help you one bit. Dingleberry's looking at him. He could, he or she could tell you. I still don't even know what kind of fish it is, but it always has a dingleberry that's two and a half times its body length while it's swimming around. That's just got to cause extra drag and make it burn more calories. Not that this fish is really doing a whole lot of work. It just kind of picks at things all day. So floating line is fine if it's all you have. There are ways to get down if you have just floating line. You can get a poly leader. You can use split shot. You can use heavier weighted flies. You could find an old sink tip and cut it up and make heads out of it. There's a variety of tools designed for people that are going to travel with the floating line and need to get down. So those things have all been invented. You can go into the local fly shops and get Rio T lines. You can get poly leaders. You can go to any sporting goods store and get extra weights. Or you can use heavier flies. Or you just roll cast upstream and swing it and sink it. I call it swinking. When you throw it upstream and swing it while it sinks down, and by the time your drift is done, you're in the strike zone. Sink tip, I think, is ideal. The reason I think a sink tip is ideal is because only the front portion of the line is in that thick medium we know as water, that that aqueous solution. I have a little bit here frozen in my my, uh, whiskey sour. Been on a whiskey sour kick lately. It's got oranges in it, so I'm getting my vitamin C. So when you go to roll cast or go to overhand cast and you have a longer rod, preferably, you can lift the tip of the line from the depths of the water, bring it up to the surface, and not have to pull 60 feet of sinking line out of the water. You can do 60 feet of floating line or intermediate, ideally floating, And then a 10, 20, 30 foot sinking head, it will just be easier. You're pulling less out of that thick medium to roll cast. You can roll cast so much easier with a sinking tip because of just the turnover of the weight. 
I want my clients to be casting more often, which means they're putting the fly in front of more fish. And by having a sink tip, they can lift their rod, pull the line up out of the water easier and roll it out. If you're going to be using a full sinking line, it's just extra work. You got to just pull that stuff up and up and it's just extra work. So let's go over some lines. Okay. Oh, got a whole bunch here. Um, that's actually another line. All right. I have Scientific Angler's Wet Tip Express Freshwater Weight Forward 350 Grain Orange Gray. So this has, oh my God, I can't even read. It is in this dark. I can't even read the back of it. It was also covered up by a price tag. So that's going to be an ideal one. Uh, for boat fishing, you know, I'll fish that from shore, but I want my clients to, who may not have as much experience roll casting and picking up a full sink tip, uh, it's just easier to have, uh, sorry, full sinking line. It's easier to just pull out a sink tip. I have an Orvis old school um, density compensated fly line, weight forward, sink class three. So again, this is a full sinking line from the moment it leaves the backing until it meets the leader. It's going to be a lot of work pulling this out, but this stuff casts because of the density of it. You can do one for all of these floating to sink tip, full sink line. All of these things will shoot so easily, especially with just one little back cast and a single haul forward, and you'll shoot it all out because you have that weight in the front. It's like a comet. It's bringing everything else behind it. Imagine just throwing a, uh, a sock. It's not going to go far, but put a golf ball in the toe and throw the sock. It's going to go further and bring the rest of the sock with it. Um, I have, hold on a second. Can you still hear me? Hear me, hear me. I'm over here, here, here. Find a line, line, line. All right, here is another one. Orvis Hydros, Sync Tip 5, Weight Forward, 8, F slash S. So floating line from when it leaves the backing until it meets up with the head, which is the sinking. This is the ideal line I want for my clients. It is super slick. It uh, casts great. It's strong. And it's pretty durable stuff. And you can get, uh, you know, the, the density is going to be how fast it sinks. This is a class five. It's going to go down fairly deep. I don't have an Orvis catalog in front of me, but that's it. Um, some other places you can get lines from. I've mentioned Discount Fly and Tackle on Santa Fe Avenue in Denver. Let's pull them up right now. All right. See what the price is on a sink tip there. They get factory rejects, which are fine. You're going to like them. They're like $10. Uh, I mean, great little shop in Denver as well. DiscountFishingDenver.com. I have no um, affiliation with them. I'm just giving them a massive shout out here. You got to wait for my internets to load. All right. Bottom left, discountfishingdenver.com, discounted fly lines. Factory overrun fly line, weight forward floating, 11. Factory overrun fly line, weight forward sink tip, 1250. Factory overrun weight forward sinking eleven fifty. Rio Bass Line thirty four. Um, scientific Anglers slow sink thirty nine. So yeah, I, I think you should go here uh, to get your fly lines if you're on a budget because fly lines, all those ones I previously mentioned, they're sixty bucks for the cheapest. Uh, the last few several years, I've got sinking lines that I've been using for the shad run where you can see the braid coming through the plastic. They're brittle, but they're fine. If uh, I fear that a big fish is going to snap them, I'll switch them out, but I need my gear to last as long as possible because I'm a small business owner. All right, let's get back to the podcast. So lines, uh, roll cast floating, sinking, ideal, hard to pull out. Uh, okay, another one. Two more lines are pertinent. If you're going to be using a floating line with a sinking add-on, like a poly leader, I want you to get the Rio outbound short. 
It is ideal for roll casting, overhand casting. It will get you fishing in pretty much any situation you can find. It's amazing on a switch rod. I have seen it on six weights. It's uh, it's pretty awesome stuff. Now the last one, save OPST for last, Olympic Peninsula Skagit Tactics, opskagit.com. These are the commando heads. They're Skagit lines designed from three weight rods and up. So if you have a five weight, I would go with one heavier. That's just my personal. I did that with, um, so I got the line for a nine foot six weight for my nine foot five weight Douglas Outdoors. It's a short uh, Skagit head and I buy their running line. It's uh Lazar line, L-A-Z-A-R. And I put it on a reel, took it out to the front yard with uh, an Orvis rod. And while I was filming with my left hand, I held the rod with my right and I pinched the running line to the cork with my index finger, did one roll cast, let go. And I want to say it probably went out 60 to 80 feet. I mean, it went from my driveway all the way into my neighbor's yard. A couple of casts actually got hung up on the power lines connecting our two houses. So if you want to make an investment that's going to make your life easy, OPST commando heads for single-handed rods for roll casting will change your shad run fishing. If you are on shore and you need to get out 60 feet, this stuff is ideal. It is a rocket and it will launch your flies out and get them where they need to be. Because if you can't get your flies to the fish, you're not going to catch any fish. So that's what I want for lines. Something that can get beat up. Something that you can shoot and roll cast easily. Something you can lift out of the depths of the water with ease. Something that won't break the budget. You don't have to go and sell plasma to buy some of these, but some of them you might. Let's talk about leaders. Leaders are pretty darn simple for shad fishing. These shad fish live about 200 feet down in the ocean. They've never seen a human. These are not fish in some local stream that get hammered by, you know, people coming out every weekend throwing the same umqua or orvis woolly bugger at them. These are not fish that you have to drop down to 7x because they're so spooky and and educated and intelligent. This is the opposite. These fish don't know what you are. They're not really scared of you. You can fish the thickest leader and tippet you can fit through your fly. It will not change how they bite. So first off, when your um, tip section of your fly line, before it goes to your leader, I want you to have about a two-foot section of 40-pound amnesia. You can connect that with a loop-to-loop knot. You can nail knot it straight to your fly line. You can perfection loop it on. You can whatever you need to do. And the reason I suggest this is when you come to roll casting and you've got a sinking line and you have no idea how deep your sinking line is, once you start lifting your rod to roll cast or you start stripping the line in, when you see that red line, and my neighbors probably are very confused with I'm stripping the line with my left hand right now. Fast, 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 fast. When you're doing that, your leader and line are going to come up and the first thing you're going to see is that hot orange then you know it's time to roll cast and pop it back out. Because if you don't, you're just going to bring that whole line in. It's just going to make it easier for you to roll cast. And then after that, you can have your leader material. Straight mono works. These fish, again, don't care. You can use tapered short sections from a fly shop. You can build them your own. It doesn't need to be long because you're using a sinking line anyway. If you have a monofilament or a... Um, fluorocarbon leader that's long, it's going to sit higher up in the water column while your line is still going down. It's going to sink slower. So the shorter your leader, the quicker your line is going to get down. And sometimes we're fishing water that is ridiculously fast. When these tidal rivers um, are blown up in the springtime, there's a lot of water running through. Now, ideally, I'm not going to fish during the super fast water, but we're going to be roll casting out into the main stem of the river and let it swing into some eddies. And if you have too fast of a water, your fly's not going to sink down in time and you're going to miss out on catching fish. 
So what I do is I'll just take uh, it's that orange amnesia and then I will nail knot or um, uh, blood knot just two feet of 20 pound Berkeley vanish and I will blood knot that to about 10 pound. Tie my first fly on, tie on two feet of eight pound Berkeley Vanish, and then tie on my damsel below that. That's pretty standard for me. I'm not fishing four, five, six, seven, eight X. We're fishing some pretty strong stuff because these these fish don't have teeth, but they're strong, and you never know if something's gonna bite and swallow the fish you're fighting. And it's just good to go a little heavier. There will always be something down there bigger than a hickory shad. Remember, a guy caught an 87-pound catfish at Chain Bridge last April 9th. And like four days later, someone in TPFR caught a rainbow trout down there. So you never know what's going to be in the water, but there will always be something down there bigger than your hickory shad. Let's talk about flies. Fly selection doesn't have to be the most important thing out there, but there are flies that work more effective than others. I'm just going to say straight up, if you're not fishing the Snow White Damsel for shad, you're not catching as many fish as you should be. The three tenants of a shad fly are, it needs to be one inch long, it needs to be bright flashy colors, and it needs to have a short tail. And your trailer fly should always be tied in a barbless hook. Let's break all that down. One inch long. These fish, um, they don't have the biggest mouths. And they're just chasing all the minnows in the water that are eating their eggs. And if you've never seen the amount of bait fish in the Potomac River or the Rappahannock in the spring up there for the shad eggs, it is insane. There are You will have a school that might take two, three minutes of just little minnows going upstream to pass you. So we're going to match what's in the water eating their eggs. Flashy, well, you want your fly to stand out against the entire school of minnows that may or may not be out there where your fly is going through. When we were on the boat last year, Jason and I were just looking down above chain bridge and about three feet down was nothing but fish. It was just backs, eyes, and heads. And that's all you could see. Couldn't see tails. They were stacked up like cordwood and just dropping a fly down there would piss them off enough to bite it. There weren't other minnows down there, but they knew that that fly was in their space and they did not want it there. And so what they do is they bite the fly. They're biting at the tail. They're nipping at it because they want to get it out of the way. They're not doing it to kill the fish. If they were doing it to kill the fish, it'd be more of a headshot and a swallow. I don't think we've ever had a shad swallow a hook. It's usually on the top of the mouth or the bottom where the glossal bone is. And short tail, well, if you've got a two-inch tail, they're going to nip at that tail. It shouldn't be balanced like a woolly bugger where the tail is the length of the body. It should be, uh, if you're using an inch, what a size four hook, your tail should be about a third the size of that. And if you're using synthetics, always cut it down if you need to. That pretty much breaks down shad flies. Again, your lead fly should be something heavier like a 116th or 132 ounce jig head. That should have a barb on it because when you tie your dropper on, that knot will slide off if there's no smash bar for it to get caught on. And then again, behind it, ideally, in order, Snow White Damsel, a Shad Puff, and then a Shad Buster, and then a One Inch Clouser. And I've been talking with um, Client Joe, south of Richmond, about synthetic material for Clousers, and we're discussing craft fur. Um, because I tie them with calf tail. And I end up just bulking up the head too much, and it looks messy. Maybe I just need to tie them a little lighter, use thinner thread, but my eyes usually get covered on them. But that is the order in which I fish my flies. You can absolutely go to the sporting store and just get crappy jigs. That will work if you don't want to spend the money. But then again, throwing a crappy jig, if you hit your rod, you're going to break it. Oh, I'm out of beverage. It's a good thing I'm almost done with this. All right, so that covers a lot of FAQs about rods, reels, lines, and leaders. You probably have most of the stuff, but you will need a specialty line this time of year if you don't have that sinking. 
and you probably have everything else already with you. If you're going to use a store-bought leader or a store-bought spool of tippet material, zero wax is fine. It doesn't have to be floral carbon. That would be – that's like um, – what's a good analogy? Using floral carbon for shad is like using a $70 bottle of Bordeaux to make sangria. It's just going to get lost. Waiters. If you're waiting – you're going to need waders unless it's uh, a late run and the water's warm enough. Don't wear waders when you're coming to fish with me thinking you're going to be stepping in the river. Um, we will never step in the Potomac River when guiding for shad. You, it's illegal. It's stupid. It's deadly. I fell in last year and uh, it was pretty scary up there. If you do want to wear waders, if it's raining, if it's windy and cold, it's a super easy way to maintain your thermoregulation. Keep that belt tight. Keep the body heat in. Uh, if you had some gross dinner, it's going to keep the stink in. So I don't have to deal with that if I'm downwind from you. But waders for going in the water, not necessary. You may need them for poison ivy or you know crawling through the brambles on the DC side. The DC side is nasty. There's more awful things to walk through up there. Uh, I don't know if snakes can bite through waders or not. I haven't seen a snake other than a baby down there in a long time. Uh, But yeah, they're just basically protect you against the elements. And if you do have to get wet for some reason, if you need to cross a tide pool or a creek, then it's beneficial to have waders. You'll see me down there wearing them all the time. Uh, When it's cold out, I stick my hands in there, keep a... Maybe a bag of sunflower seeds in, in the pouch, whatever you need. So the thing is about waders. They're expensive, and if you can prevent unnecessary wear and tear on them, uh, it's better. You will prolong the life. You can wear them shad fishing for a month straight, or you can prolong them for a month of fishing out west You know, in the summer. So choose when you want to beat up with the wear and tear on your waders. I've been fishing my Orvis Sonic seams now. This is my sixth season, and... Really no problems with them other than they're just nasty. I mean, those things are, they're gross. Footwear. I don't want to see any open-toed shoes if you're coming to fish with me. That is not the terrain for wearing open-toed shoes. One of my first client trips on the Potomac River, the guy wore open-toed shoes and ended up ripping his toenail off. It was pretty nasty. Um, There's a lot of broken glass down there. A lot of people just leave bottles behind when they're poaching at night and they break them or someone else breaks them or they wash down, there's broken glass everywhere. It, it's just easier. You can trip and bust a toe, get scraped up. There's a lot of rusty stuff down there. Uh, ideally, wellies would be the best thing you can wear. I uh, wear knee-high rubber boots with a zipper on the side, thick soles. You can go to Walmart, get a cheap pair, range your surplus. Uh, Marshalls has rain boots. Go look for something that's inexpensive and will just keep you dry in case you need to step in anything deeper than your ankle. Um, they're great. The more you start wearing wellies, you're going to realize you know, why the English have been wearing them for so long. They're just phenomenal. I could wear wellies almost daily out and about. and I certainly go to the grocery store. I, After client trips, before client trips, pick my kid up from school. I will be wearing wellies probably in two weeks' time. So today is the Ides of March. I'll probably be wearing them constantly through about the second week of May. Get a nice, good pair. The tight ones where nothing's going to fall in them, no ticks or anything, uh, sticks, branches, etc. Make sure they're comfy so you don't get blisters if you got to hump it from Fletcher's all the way above Chain Bridge. Studs on boots are pretty good, especially when you're going through all these rocks. I took the studs off my corkers last week when I was fishing with Omar, and I had rubber soles, and it was awful. For some reason, I wanted to put rubber soles on, and those, save those for the boat, man. I, those things have no use anywhere except on, on a drift boat. Metal spikes for me if I'm wearing my corkers. Absolutely. Felt never. Let's talk gadgets. What are you going to need for the shad run? Stuff you pretty much already have. Strong pair of nippers that can cut through 20-pound and 40-pound line. You're going to need pliers. You need to smash barbs. 
the other reason um, – I'll get to this probably later. I mentioned this with the barbless hooks is, is why you need them. Shad and stripers flop around a whole lot and the white perch spin around because you don't want to grab them due to the dorsal fin. So they're going to be spooging everywhere for lack of better terms. The faster you can get these fish to hand or net and get the hook out, the least amount of damage you're going to do to them. Stripers will flop and spin in a circle and the shad are going to do that. Shad also have, remember they're called scoots. It's a it's almost a serrated line of scales on their belly going back and they will cut your hand up. Um, you don't want to lip some of these fish because they're going to jerk around. You're going to get a hook in your thumb. I'm using pretty sharp hooks out there and I don't want to get punctured. I don't want the fish to be messed up. I don't want to rip a hole in its cheek, etc. So pliers for smashing barbs, pliers for taking hooks out. Um, I actually just fish, um, Pliers now. I mean, I don't really use hemostat down there. Hold on. I got to text the boss. Kitchen. Hold on. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, so you need a good pair of pliers. I'm using P-Line from Amazon. They're like $24. The sheath sucks, but they're pretty solid. They'll cut anything and they take a beating. Rubber bag net is ideal. I went to the Cabela's out here last week to check out the new one and realized there really wasn't a whole lot there I really needed, but I did check to see if uh, they had rubber bag replacements. You remember I had a hole in mine, and I hooked Jason Steelhead, and it went right through. The reason you want rubber bags is easier on the fish. Plus, if you get a gizzard shad and they stink, you do not want to touch that fish. I don't want to touch that fish with your hands let alone mine. So rubber bag and net, scoop them up, take the hook out, rinse the slime off, you're good to go. You should have binoculars. Now, this is not for the bikini hatch, fellas. You should have binoculars for watching birds. Look where the cormorants and ospreys are targeting fish. You want to look up and downstream. If there's a boat doing electro shocking, you're going to want to watch to see what they pull up. You'd be surprised the size of the fish that are right below where you're fishing that you didn't know were down there. You want to check the weather. Uh, you want to look at other boats, see how people are doing. There was probably another reason. I'm also just looking to see about illegal activity. I'm sort of the eyes down on the Potomac on my side and people across from me. And if there's any infraction, I will not hesitate to call that in and get you busted. And last but not least for gadgets is a headlamp. If you're walking in in the morning, I don't know why you're out that early. But if you're walking out and you're fishing after work, headlamps a pretty good idea. If you get there early on Saturday mornings, you're usually going to find headlamps the poachers left behind. I've got some pretty nice ones. You can get pretty good headlamps now. They're not too expensive. Every store sells them. Target has them now. Walmart. You can go get really good ones at REI, Bean, etc. And, of course, uh, your fly shop should sell some pretty solid headlamps. And that's about it for gadgets. Some additional things. These are the ones I had to sit down over the last couple of days and keep the computer on or my notebook out. Water. You're not going to realize it, but roll casting out there. And I I don't want to be out there on the cold days. The cold days suck. I want to be out there on the hot day where I need to walk down with a gallon of Gatorade. Uh, The days when you run out of liquid, you know, within the first hour or two are usually going to be the best days of fishing. So don't get dehydrated. There's nowhere down there except Fletcher's Boathouse to buy beverage. Unless you're fishing, I don't know, maybe the Tidal Basin for shad and you're hitting up the water fountains. But if you're at spots like Fredericksburg, of course, you can walk out and there's KFC. And that's a good KFC. Uh, You get chicken pot pies. At least you could back in college. Um, Yeah, you just cross the bridge or cross the river and go up into town. There's plenty of stores. But if you're humping it in and hiking in or riding your bike or you're stuck on a boat, you got to bring it with you. Polarized glasses. First off, you just need glasses. I've been hit in the glasses several times by clients trying to overhand cast around the rocks, which is why I don't want them doing it. Uh, Don't lose an eye. Just wear glasses. We're polarized. I have to send a pair of mine in to get fixed, but I always have a spare pair, and I usually carry them for clients 
So if you're fishing low light conditions, just bring safety glasses from your hardware store. Same ones you'd use if you were working in shop class. I don't care if you look nerdy, you can take them off your grip and grin. I'd rather look nerdy and know I look nerdy than um, have to have Dr. Jones bring me down to the river. And he's pretty dumb. He's not going to be the best seen eye dog. Um, He's just going to bark at everything. Like he would bark at cormorants all day. He wouldn't even walk down there. He's such a sissy. Big hats. If you're on the D.C. side, if you're boating or wading anywhere, you're exposed to the elements. You don't want to get dehydrated, especially if you call into work with the shad flu on Thursday afternoon and you come to work on Friday with your uh, forehead burnt. They're going to know you weren't in bed. They're going to know you were out fishing. Um, But yeah, if you do come down with the shad flu, I'll write you a prescription for uh, a couple hours on the river. Let me know. I'll send it to your boss. Face mask is ideal. Um, Keep the sun, keep the wind off you. It'll also help keep all the pollen out of your nares. That's an additional benefit. It's going to keep your neck from getting sunburnt. And if it's hot, it's just going to soak up some of the sweat. There are super good ones out there now. You can get them for inexpensive. Get yourself a good face mask. Sunscreen. Always have sunscreen on. There's no sense in getting skin cancer over fishing. I've already had stuff lasered off my nose. I admit I don't wear it as often as I should. Oftentimes, I've got a face mask and a big hat on and will just forget to put it in a certain part of my face. But for the most part, I'm pretty much covered up when I'm down there. If I can wear sun gloves, I'll do that. Face mask, big hat. Just There's no sense in getting dehydrated, having your skin exposed, and then getting sunburnt and long-term damage. I'm going to tell you to use Dermatone. That's my preferred sunscreen. When I'm tying flies now, I'm using Dr. Dan's. That one really just, it's its uh, skin lotion without sunscreen. Um, it's really good on your hands when you're tying flies. Trash bags. Two reasons you need a trash bag. One, there's a lot of scumbags out there that just leave everything behind. So be a good steward and clean up the river after other people. If you're in the boat and you're chucking cans and wrappers around, um, Throw them in your trash bag. I guarantee you something's going to float by you from another boat that got blown out or something from upstream or something from shore that got blown in. Take your net, scoop it up, row your boat over, get it, whatever. Just That's our beer water, folks. So keep it clean. Secondly, if you do happen to catch a snakehead and want to take it home, they secrete so much mucus, you're going to want to put it in there. That's how you can know the snakehead poachers. It's a spinning rod, a frame pack, and a bunch of trash bags, a raincoat. Third reason for trash bags. Last year, it looked like it was going to be a nice day at my client from the UP of Michigan. And he's wearing shorts and a t-shirt because he's from up there. And I was freezing. Didn't have my raincoats or layers. So what I ended up doing was taking the trash bag. And this has been embarrassing ever since. And I cut a hole for my head and kept my arms inside for about six hours. It was miserable. I was shivering. Just one of those things as a guide that should not happen. Like, absolutely, I should never have been unprepared for that. Now, if I was fishing by myself, I probably could have just driven home or gone to a store and gotten a hoodie or something and come back down. But with the client, I got to be with them. It was an eight-hour trip. At least the lunch was pretty awesome. Toilet paper. There's a lot of places on the D.C. shoreline you can go back in the woods and drop the kids off at the pool. Be sure to bury it. Don't be like the... The snaggers that will just do it on the trail in your fishing spot, it's disgusting. It happens. I don't know why they do it, but it's it's nasty. Stripping guard. That's becoming more and more important for me uh, almost each year that we're out to have a stripping guard. If you are not popping your rod tip and stripping as fast as you can. It should look like right now I'm playing the drums. Bang. I'm stripping with my left hand and I'll pop in the tip of the rod with my right. I'm moving that cork back and forth. The more aggressive you strip and pop that fly, you're going to get a more aggressive reaction from those fish. Now, granted, you can roll cast it out and just hold that fly in the current. You'll catch a fish. But if you're doing it fast and jerking that rod tip and that water should be flying up as you're, jer- you know, pop, pop, pop. I'm, I did a movie of it last year and it slowed down towards the end. But 
It was almost a fish on every cast. And if you're doing that, you're going to hook fish. If you can't do that, that's why you hire me for the day. Stripping guards. They make different ones. Apparently, Dan, our TPFR godfather, would use Barbie doll pants. That Because, you know, all kids take off Barbie doll clothes. We've got more, like, naked Barbies. There's two that are sitting in an orange Halloween pumpkin right now. And they look like they're at some, like, Dan Bilzerin party. Uh, but Rio makes some good ones. Buff makes some good ones. Basically, the soft ones are going to get super stinky and slimy. If you don't want to do that, you want to save money, uh, you could use duct tape. You could use Band-Aids. You can use gauze like tape. Uh, cotton 3M one-inch tape. Next time you're at the doctor's office, it's what they put a band uh, that little gauze on you after they take your blood. Just ask them for a roll. If not, CVS has it. We have a medical supply store on Route 7 in uh, Falls Church that has them. There are a variety of things you can do to keep your finger from getting burnt by the plastic. It's basically a friction burn. The faster you strip that line and if it's dry, it will burn your finger. So index fingers should be covered up. Trust me on that. A hook file. You're going to be dinging your hooks on everything out there. Rocks, boats, trees. You never know. A hook file is always good to have. I have mine on my lanyard. A stream thermometer. If uh, you're old school and you're not looking at websites, perfect way. I just got one for cooking. It's a laser. Got it on Amazon for $16. And I've been obsessed. I've been drinking coffee this week because the wife's been out of town and I've been dealing with the kid by myself. So I sit there and measure it like every couple of minutes. I don't drink it fast enough. And it goes from like 110, 107, 105, 102, 97. So I can take that out there and zap the water at different depths, hopefully get a good reading. Again, my ideal temperature is 63 degrees and up. They will absolutely be in there in the colder water. Um, but I, and I was wrong last year. I science fact, there are written things about morphology and, um, sex reproduction and fertilization and embryo development in shad. That is all temperature based. Some of them don't leave when it gets cold. They'll hang out. Trolling motor. If you're going to take out a boat at Fletcher's, you can put on an electric trolling motor, and not have to row. It's not that well advertised, but after owning a drift boat now for so many years, I can't row anybody else's boat where the oars pop out. I I refuse to do it. Um, So if you have a trolling motor, which I bartered with Justin, uh, I got mine, fixed it a little bit on Burke Lake a couple weeks ago, so it's a little more smooth running. They're nice. Uh, PFD, if you're on a boat, you have to wear one. It's not an option. It's common sense. The amount of deaths that we have in the Potomac every year is mind-boggling. From people jumping in thinking they can swim to just accidents. You know, Forrest Gump said it. That happens. Uh, you can wear one on the shore if you want. I'm not going to laugh at you. Um, I try not to get close enough to the shore where I'm going to fall in, but it happened once. And if you're going to get one, get the kind that can inflate at a certain depth. That's I've heard stories about people being unconscious and falling off boats, and that's the only thing that saved them. You fall in the Potomac at Chain Bridge, you're pretty much not coming out. And a whistle. You should always have a whistle on you, even if you're not in a boat. It's a good way to signal for help. It's a good way just to signal in general um, if you're in trouble, etc. First aid kit's pretty good. I just thought of that. There was a woman last year. You can take a trail from Roosevelt Island all the way up to Chain Bridge. And then people go back. And a woman last year fell and slit her knee open. And it was one of my clients, I think, from a couple days before, drove her to the hospital because she was on foot. But I had my first aid kit, so we patched her up temporarily. Uh, There are just minor things that can go happen from hooks in people to minor scrapes, cuts, bruises, abrasions, etc. It's good to have a first aid kit. Now I'm going to talk about some last things before I finish this up. Uh, the U S park police number, I'm going to repeat these. These will also be on the actual posting on, uh, on iTunes where it explains 
what the podcast is. If you see anything illegal going on on the D.C. shoreline from Little Falls to Wilson Bridge or from the Virginia side from Chain Bridge to the Wilson Bridge, the number is 202-610-7500. Again, 202 202- 610-7500. Anything that is illegal, fires, poaching, litter, uh, alcohol technically, call it in. Virginia, Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries, VDGIF, violations is 800-237-5712. Again, 800-237-5712. If you're on the James River, the Rappahannock, anywhere where... VDGIF has jurisdiction. They do not have jurisdiction on the Potomac shoreline in D.C. That is federal. So you'll be calling the U.S. Park Police. Call VDGIF or the police to report anything illegal. Remember, a lot of these fish that we are targeting are threatened and or endangered species. And you cannot take them from the river. There was a Russian guy last year posting grilled hickory shad all over Instagram. I'm like, dude, you basically like... It's like taking a selfie in front of a bank with a wad of cash. You just don't do that. So we all made comments about how legal it was, and he didn't take it down. Uh, it's incriminating himself. And if you want to get into the whole thing about why we're targeting species that are spawning, it's not like sunfish family members or salmonids where they're digging out a nest and they're staying with the nest for a period of time. These are open water spawners. They are producing thousands of eggs. Uh, We're not really interrupting their spawn, per se. We're disrupting it for a little bit. Maryland Department of Natural Resources is 800-635-6124. Again, Maryland DNR, 800-635-6124. That phone number is 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The kids will tell you that's 24-7. 24-7. Websites and apps. If you want to know the tides where you are so you're not waiting and all of a sudden it's shoulder deep, Tide app is the one I use on my phone. It has Chainbridge and one mile below Chainbridge, which is about Fletcher's Cove. Uh, weather.gov is the Potomac River near Washington, D.C., Little Falls. That will tell you the predicted flow. If you want to fish on Friday and you had a massive thunderstorm on Tuesday, it will show you the expected amount of river rising. Again, once the river reaches five feet and above at Little Falls, Fletcher's Cove will not rent boats. The United States Geological Survey, USGS Potomac River near Washington, D.C., Little Falls Pump Station, That is another one we use. That also tells you the temperature at various distances throughout the water column. It will also tell you how many particles are in the water at a time, which tells you if the water is completely muddy and chocolate or if it is nice and crystal clear. I love me some shad fishing on a crystal clear day where you can see down like six or seven feet. You see the baby snakes and the minnows and the herring are at your feet and the shad and the snake heads come up to breathe and a cormorant pops up and scares the crap out of you. It's fun. Doppler. Uh, Thomas likes Storm. I like WUSA9. I think they use it for other weather channels, but you can set it to show you Storm Track and Doppler. You should know the air temperatures for the day. You should know the cloud cover because you're still going to get burned. And you should be able to know when inclement weather is approaching so you can get back and not get struck by lightning. And Instagram, tag Shadness Madness. I think Remix Mothers is the one who coined the term. Uh, Saw him two nights ago at Beer Tie. I will be seeing a lot of his pictures. Fly Times DC. Also Alex Binstead, Fletcher's Cove. uh, Some other people that will be out shad fishing. Share your pictures. Tag me. Tag Tidal Potomac Fly Rodders. Tag your local fly shops. Have a good time doing this. Stay safe. This is not technical fishing. You're not matching the hatch. You are simply needing to get the fly down to where the fish are and move that fly fast enough to piss off the fish into biting. That's about all I have for this podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. And please take a look at the Risen Fly website that uh, 
Silicon Fly Box is pretty ridiculous. Jason and I are tying a bunch on Risen Fly hooks right now. And again, you can get uh, floating lines from them at a great price. And again, their silver metal beads for my chartreuse woolly buggers are pertinent to my business. Thank you so much for downloading the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast. The next one is going to be from the United States Marine Corps Museum in Dumfries, Virginia. We've got the Project Healing Waters tie this weekend. So I'm tying up about 100 worms before I get there so I can walk around and talk to everybody. So we're going to have some of you listeners on the podcast next week. Jason, do your thing. Thank you for joining us for the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast. For more information or to contact Rob, please go to www.robsnowwhite.com. And if you lack the strength of your own, honey, hold out your hands and take it from an old man. Freestone Media at Freestone.